spend a little bit of time, I'm just going to introduce who, who I am, um, our project, but I'm going to spend most of the time talking about um, cross-border payments, remittances, and blockchain, and where that's going, where it is today, and, and where it could end up in a few years. Just to introduce myself, I'm Will Madden. Um, my background is in financial services. I spent a little over 15 years working at Western Union uh, in payments and prepaid and also cash remittance and digital remittance. Uh, I learned about Bitcoin very, very early. It was late 2010, uh, before there were even a lot of exchanges out there. So I've been following it since really, really early and um, finally left sort of the corporate world to start Bridge 21 in March of 2014. So it took me a little longer than a lot of people to get the courage to do that, but I'm, I'm really glad that I did. Um, what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today is really cross-border payments and remittances and some of the fascinating things that are going on in this industry. To start it off, um, just really a question, which is, you know, a riddle, which is what do nuclear power plants have in common with financial systems? And the answer is, when they melt down, it's a freaking catastrophe, right? But what people don't realize is the difference in scale. So if you look at the damage to world GDP, according to our best estimates, from the two biggest nuclear disasters in history, we're guessing it's around $750 billion in damage to world GDP. If you look at just the 2008 financial crisis, the damage to GDP was an order of magnitude greater than an order of magnitude bigger than the two worst nuclear incidents in history. So the message is money is a lot more powerful than people realize. Um, another thing that I think about a lot is this lady. So she's texting or communicating with somebody on the other side of the planet instantly for free and doesn't give it a second thought. But think about this, what happens when she needs to pay that person on the other side of the planet? You know, what she quickly realizes is that in a lot of cases, it's faster and cheaper to put money in an envelope and mail it to the other side of the planet than it is to try to figure out how to pay electronically online. So it's um, challenging and, and an interesting curiosity. You know, cross-border payments have increased 50 times over since the 70s, but the way that we send money over borders really hasn't changed since international wires were created in 1974. And if you look at it, it's not that there isn't a market for this or millions of underserved people, right? We've got, according to World Bank estimates, over 250 million people who are migrant workers in different countries. And these are people who really need help, right? They need every penny and they're not being served by our financial systems today. They're just not. Um, not because of malice, but because we can't do it cost effectively enough to move money at that, like, at that transaction size. Um, and then the market itself, conservatively 300 billion is sent between countries with uh, migrant workers and individuals. And if you add small and medium enterprises into the mix, pardon me, it's well over 10 trillion every year. So it's a huge, huge opportunity. The question is why hasn't money kept up with the speed of information? And, or to put that a different way, why can't we email money? Um, the first real reason that we couldn't was technical. The good news is that's been solved and it's this cat picture, right? Your grandmother uploads this cat picture onto Facebook and it goes viral. And before you know it, uh, you know, there are millions of copies of this cat picture all over the internet. The thing is that you can't tell the difference between that millionth cat picture and the first one because computers are really, really good at copying files exactly. In the world of money, we call that counterfeiting. Um, so the good news is that Bitcoin and all of the cryptocurrencies that have come out since then have really cracked the code on this. We've been able to prevent digital counterfeiting, which is the basis of sound money. So that's incredibly powerful that that exists, but there are other problems, right? There are other reasons we can't email money. And this is the, the really big one. The, um, the banking systems of the world are completely incompatible. You know, a, a bank in the United States has completely different office hours than one in India. So they're not even open at the same times. And the rules that they have to follow to move money in and out of the systems are completely different and antiquated. And all of this is written into regulation that goes back 10 or hundreds of years. So changing it is really expensive and hard. And you've got large incumbents who don't have a lot of reason to change things because they've already built everything around the existing system. So there are a lot of challenges around remittances and making things as fast as they should be, even though we have the technology. Um, so kind of with that, 
That's why we're in this situation today. That's why today's money requires intermediaries. It's why we have a SWIFT. There's somebody in the middle who's keeping score and making sure that person A and person B isn't copying or, or double spending or counterfeiting. But there's also this huge, huge body of knowledge staying on top of these systems, both from a compliance side of things, but also making sure that you aren't defrauded because they're so complicated, it's pretty easy to commit fraud inside of the system. So that's, that's where we are today, right? So kind of begs the question, how does blockchain help this situation? If it's not really a technology problem, how does blockchain solve you know, the fact that a lot of the problem is really written into to law? Um, and that's what I'm gonna to attempt to, to show you and answer for you today. You know, traditional money transfer, it's presented as going through SWIFT. It, it does, but it's actually very different. Large enterprise money transfer companies have accounts in every country that they do business in. And what they're really doing is balancing currency exposure in each country and market. And they only move money when they absolutely have to. Um, they're also using derivatives and contracts on currency to sort of hedge their risk so they're never overexposed. Um, so it's, it's a complicated game they play. They do it really efficiently and really well. So, you know, the, the international money movement aspect of remittance is actually less of a problem than a lot of people think. I, I think technologists who want to sort of crack into remittances think they're going to solve everything by building some sort of cryptocurrency or um, kind of global sort of intermediary for different local currencies. And that's part of it. But there isn't as much efficiency to be gained um, as you might think, believe it or not, which is, is kind of bad news. The, the big message, the big thing that I've learned running a company that has lots of customers now, uh, at least US to Mexico, is it's the pricing. So every company in the world that does money transfer, banks, remittance companies, even every other blockchain remittance company, they price based on spot rates from currency markets. So they'll look at what the euro and the Great British Pound are trading at, take that, mark it up a little bit maybe, and then charge a fee on top of that, and that's your price. The advantage that blockchain gives you is actually something you might not expect. It uses exchanges on ramps and off ramps in the sending and receiving countries. You've got to have that to make it work. But what it really gives you are non-correlated exchange rates. So that's a little bit of a complex topic, but I'm going to spend a little time talking about what that really means. Um, and you might think, well, you know, is that really that big of a deal? Is it, is it a big difference? The truth is, it is. So these are um, this is a history of every quote we've ever given a customer who wanted to move US dollars into Mexican pesos. And it's a little hard to understand, but, and it's also live. If you look at the top there, it's in the footer of our site. We've been able to really just demolish the rates that money transfer companies are charging using really just Bitcoin right now. And we can do a lot better by adding more um, crypto assets like Ethereum into the mix too. Um, what this is, what is driving this is, what is the best price that we can buy a blockchain asset with US dollars? And what is the best price that we can sell it for in pesos? But instead of you know, arbitrage, like you might think of it if you were sort of trading on different exchanges, if you're sending $1,000 using Bridge 21, we're actually buying $1,000 worth of crypto in US dollars and selling it in pesos for your transaction. So we're settling atomically. We may not move the money for every transaction um, because the fees on some of the crypto networks are getting a little high, but the actual exposure is settled instantly. And what we do differently, and I think that this is the way that things are going to go, we actually pass that price to you as a customer. So we sort of take this veil off of how this actually works and price directly through to the end user. And what that means is if you look at this chart, there have been times that we've really been able to beat like the wholesale rates that banks offer by 10, 15, even 20% for large amounts of money. So, you know, when that happens, um, it doesn't take a whole lot to get people to try out your service because they can save a whole lot of money. So it's very exciting. Um, a lot of skeptics say that this is just arbitrage or that it's temporary, but I, you know, I would argue it's not. And I think using blockchain assets to connect different exchanges to different countries to facilitate cross-border payments is really the future. Um, the reason that that's a false assumption, even though it makes sense, is um, well, a lot of reasons. But if you look at commodities markets, backwardation and contango and, and these strange situations where futures prices 
are, you know, uh, more expensive than stuff you can buy today, you know, that don't make sense still exist. So country specific demand and supply, if there's an ICO in the United States, that's super hot, right? But maybe it's not so hot in Mexico or a very large investor in Mexico decides to buy a whole lot of Ethereum. That is all it takes to create an imbalance that can be turned into an exchange rate that's beneficial and superior to what everybody else has. Um, just to run through it, a couple of other things that people don't think about, direct crypto to crypto exchange, you know, services like Shapeshift or the major exchanges that allow you to go directly from one to one cryptocurrency to another, um, could even be through atomic swaps, it doesn't matter. That creates um, discrepancies in different markets that can be used to power blockchain remittance. Um, the other thing is it's not really just about arbitrage. It turns out that partnerships really matter as much as the arbitrage. So having good relationships with your exchange partners and also your regulators to make sure that you're compliant and above board is huge. And um, I think the biggest lesson is with remittance, speed is a whole lot less important than price. You know, I think a lot of blockchain um, remittance companies kind of promote their ability to make global payments instantly and it's so much faster. The truth is when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, you can't really, because there's so much reversal risk when you take payment from a customer in a certain country that they might have a chargeback, right? How do you put through a payment to Mexico? Even though you can do it in 10 seconds, why would you if you might have a chargeback for four or five days out from when they paid you? So the, the reason there's a delay in international remittance has more to do with the local payment system than it does the technology. Technology is great, but if you don't have a fraud uh, and risk management um, kind of a, you know program around payment reversals that kind of puts a delay into things, you're going to go out of business pretty quickly. So um, speed is actually less important than price because of flaws in today's money uh, payment systems. Is the big the big message. Um, Recipes for a successful blockchain remittance company, if you, if you want to compete with Bridge21, uh, you need compliant exchanges with deep liquid markets. The assets have to trade and you have to be able to move a good bit of money before you get slippage in the price. You absolutely have got to have connections to the local banking system. If you can't get money in and out of a country, nobody cares, right? If they want to buy crypto, they'll do that on a cryptocurrency exchange. This is about money transfer using traditional currencies. Um, you've got to have a team with payments expertise. So you have to understand fraud reversals and the rules of each payment system. Not only the technology, but also you know the crypto technology, but the local traditional technology used to make payments. And um, you don't have to look very far to see people making big mistakes in these areas because they don't have that experience. And then you know, the, the probably the last, but definitely not least, user experience, the technology. But the go-to-market strategy, you have to have a product that people want to use. And I think that that's the thing that people struggle most with. It's um, very troublesome and costly to acquire customers in this business. And if you don't have a good strategy to do that, you're, you're pretty much finished. So um, just to run through it, if you're, if you're thinking of starting remittance or getting into the space, market cap, of course, matters. And I mean, down the line, Bitcoin is still far and away number one. I think the whole market is 200 billion. The market cap's 122 billion on Bitcoin. Ethereum is not far behind at 32. Bitcoin Cash, just out of nowhere on August 1st, right? And I think a few days ago, it was actually higher than Ethereum and it's back down and jury's out on where that's going to land. But it's um, exciting and that, that's definitely a potential, um, especially if it's traded in more markets to facilitate uh, cross-border payments. Uh, Ripple, Litecoin, you know, number four and five in terms of market cap. But perhaps what's more important than this metric um, is really the, just the trading volume. And this is global. So you'll want to look at specific countries. That's what will matter to you if you're doing remittance. You'll want country A and country B trading volume. But down the line, um, Bitcoin, of course, is number one. Cash is not far behind. And that, that could be temporary interest, but we'll see. And um, you can see Ripple's actually out of the list and Tether, um, mostly happening around you know, a Bitfinex and Kraken, uh, is pretty high on the list of um, trading volume. So by having a lot of trading volume in one of these assets, it means that you can move a lot of money through it without moving the price, which is super important. Um, crypto risk. This is a big deal for any company that's kind of using exchange of cryptocurrency in any capacity, right? The, for dummies version is you want to minimize exposure first. So what we do is by buying and selling in two countries at the same time, we're able to not have a lot of customer money locked up in any cryptocurrency 
we move it from the sending to the receiving currency very fast. And what that means is the amount of exposure we have at any one time, if we lose all the money that's exposed, it's not gonna be the end of the world for us. So the speed from the tech, and also having the partnerships to do things like zero confirmation on Bitcoin or, or similar for other cryptos is super important. So you've got to have that really well thought through or you're kind of just day trading and gambling, right? So that's not good. You don't want that. Um, you, of course, want to use open source software that's been peer reviewed and popular. You don't want to use niche stuff that you just found on some random GitHub. If you're basing something on open source, you want to start from um, a really good, well peer reviewed kind of code base in general. Um, and independently audit your infosec. This is should be required if it's not. And I think in the U.S. you pretty much have to get it annually uh, if you're doing things above board. But it's just generally a good idea to get an independent third party to look at what you're doing and kind of make sure that you've covered all your bases. So do these things if you're going to get into crypto remittance. Um, the reason that's important, and I think this audience probably knows this, but there's a whole lot of risk, right? One in three exchanges have been hacked. 10% of all Bitcoin has been stolen. And hundreds of millions, just last week, it's, it's now mid hundreds of millions have been lost just to coding mistakes with Ethereum, right? Um, so there's a, a lot of risk, catastrophic risk. If you look at you know, Magic the Gathering online exchange, it was originally 850,000 Bitcoin that were lost. They found 200,000, but that's still sizable. And um, you know, it's kind of the interesting twist with that is because they settled in yen back then, the, they're actually going to come out with a lot of extra profit because it's appreciated so much. It's, it's worth more now and yen, but still a tragedy and a really big confidence shakeup. If you're a remittance company that using Gox back then and you had a lot of crypto there, I mean, you're, you're up the creek, right? You, you have to be very careful. Same thing with Bitfinex. I mean, they recovered, which is remarkable and good for them. But if you were happened to be using them for remittance at that time and you had a whole lot of your assets stuck there, um, that could put you in a real bind, right? You might be in a situation where you don't have enough capital to keep going, and that could that could end your business. So those are sort of your um, fraud and hacking risks on the left, but on the right, just coding errors, right? The DAO, 60 million, and we forked. So it's only Classic that's a loss, Ethereum Classic, but that's still 5% of the value. So you have 3 million loss, it's, it's not insignificant. And then the parity wallet issue last week, um, I'm not up on my news, so I don't know where that one's going, if we're going to fork or not, but really huge, right? 616,000 Ether just lost because of you know, a junior developer made a mistake. So the stakes are very high. So you want to minimize your risk and exposure. Um, red flags, if you have an exchange that has no user custody, you don't see audits. None of their stuff is um, open source. They're not sharing with the community and interactive and it's kind of closed. That actually describes most crypto exchanges. So it's, not necessarily, it's not necessarily the end of the world. But if you see that in combination with slower frozen withdrawals or outages, that means something could be amiss and you might have a couple of days before the executives decide what they want to do to get your money out. So I've just seen that happen over and over and over again. Pardon me, these three things in combination are super dangerous and mean that you need to move to a different exchange. Um, Again, the best way to mitigate this is don't leave a lot of cryptocurrency on third-party exchanges. Best advice I can give you. Get it in, get it out, and get it off. So um, lastly, I'm trying to zip through this so we have time, remittance and regulation. It's my favorite thing in the world to talk about. Um, so I just do the history, right? Started off in 2013 with FinCEN. They ruled that you know crypto was virtual currency. They regulated it kind of like money transfer or check cashing. You know, we want to we want to know your customer. We want to check the sanctions list, and their their approach was actually made a lot of sense. They were looking at the on and off ramps and trying to control it there, but it just got more and more complicated, right? And so we're just at the federal level, just in the U.S. Uh, the SEC comes in with a savings and loan scandal, the Ponzi, the Bitcoin savings and loan, and they call it money because they want to go after you know the person that perpetrated this Ponzi scheme. Um, then the IRS calls it property, right? So how are we going to tax, treat this from a tax perspective? 2014, the IRS calls it property. Now, if you think about this, the IRS and FinCEN are both in the treasury. So you have two, <laughs> two departments, in this, both in the treasury, that have different definitions of cryptocurrency, and it's only 2014. So um, you know, then the CFTC in 2015, it's a commodity. And then, you know, kind of a do-over, right? The SEC sees these ICOs going bananas. Um, you know, maybe this is a security, right? Uh, so at a federal level, um, 
it's anybody's guess where this is going to be in two years or if, if this is all going to, you know, be multiple or one thing. State by state, none of this is legal advice, but it's just as much of a patchwork, patchwork quilt. You have, you know, the bit license in New York, California, trying to pass, uh, what is it, 801384, don't quote me on the number on that, um, all the way down to unregulated. Uh, you know, even New Hampshire that was very restrictive and just recently kind of reversed that back to the unregulated bucket. Um, so when it comes to sort of virtual currency, nobody really knows. Um, if you're using it for remittance, typically you're gonna be treated as a money transmitter. So you should just assume that you need to get licensing or at least talk to the regulators and have open dialogue. That's the way to go. Um, globally, it's even more complicated. So depending on where you look, and I haven't updated this, so this could actually be completely wrong at this point, but you have a huge spectrum here too. So um, yeah, it's something you've got to keep on top of is regulation and how things are emerging and super, super important especially with China, you know, I mean, if um, you're not ahead of the curve on that, you can get, you can get stuck. And if your money is frozen on an exchange in China, that could end your business too. So um, regulatory strategies, at least for U.S. businesses, you can go state by state and country by country. You can form an agency relationship with an existing money transmitter, or you can also uh, get into deals where you rebrand an existing transmitter service. So there are uh, larger FX shops that will do that now and will even talk to blockchain companies. So all three of these are possible and we're looking at our business at all three options right now. So um, that's it. So I think that, you know, it may take a lot of time, but hopefully we can get to a world where this lady can not only text somebody on the other side of the planet, but also send them money. Uh, and I think that may happen faster than anyone realizes. So super excited to be in the industry and I hope that helped. Um, I'll probably just paste this. If you're interested in learning more about our, our venture, you can email us. I'd actually prefer it if you joined our community Slack. It's not really so much about bridges, it's about talking about cryptocurrency. But we are we are starting a fundraising round on AngelList. It's not up yet, but if you're interested or want to meet our lead investor, um, happy to facilitate that introduction. Probably shoot me an email. So um, you know, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and um, just open it up for Q and A for the remainder of the time. Uh, we don't today. So right now, um, we're live from the U.S. to Mexico. We have the um, contracts in place and really almost the rails to do several other countries. We haven't announced which those are going to be, but um, part of the reason we're raising money is basically to finance the go-to-market strategy for those new rails. So we're super excited to move into some more markets from the U.S. And um, you can probably guess what those are just based on the numbers. Yes, we, we are. So we, we use multiple source exchanges um, in, in the sending country in the U.S. just because there's so many places you can buy crypto with dollars. So we, we do have a little bit of least cost routing going on on the send side. Uh, on the receive side, it depends on the market, right? So in Mexico, um, we've really found that Bitso is our, our single partner. They, um, they've been great. They're great. Really just in all aspects of it, not just the technology, but their responsiveness as a team. So we've stuck with them. Um, I think in, in you know emerging markets or less established markets, you might only have one exchange you can work with, maybe two. So um, primary customer acquisition channels uh, so far are digital. And part of the reason we're raising money is we know we can do a lot better uh, by going um, and using really just the strategies that you, you use um, doing money transfer in different corridors, you know, with Hispanic market, it's a lot more in person, right? And you really want to get out there. Uh, it's also radio. So we have plans to market a lot of different ways, but right now it's really digital. And a lot of our business comes from comparison sites. So there are third party sites that will compare our rates to everybody else. And when that chart goes very high, I mean, it just, we blow everyone's prices away. So it's um, kind of like free customer sign up week when that happens. So that's, that's our main acquisition strategy. Oh, uh, Abra, um, I really like that project. You know, I, I, um, I think it's ambitious. I, I don't know why they shut down the human exchange initiative. Um, I saw the, the, the presentation at Money 2020. Um, and, you know, it, it's really interesting kind of the direction they're heading. Uh, I think that they um, have now raised kind of two larger rounds. So they have a war chest to do something impressive. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to see them if they can kind of choose one aspect of it and really deliver on it, right? Like get some revenue, get some customers. And maybe they have, I'm not on their shareholder update list. So I don't, I don't know if they're doing well or not, but 
I think it's really at this point kind of how do we apply this and make something exciting out of it. Um, I really like the idea of Abra. I think um, the, the risks that I always thought about that project early on were I couldn't figure out how if you got scale, a regulator wouldn't see that as you know, me being a money transfer agent. And, and when that happens, you know, all bets are off. Like it's no longer Uber, right? It's something entirely different. So, um, but I think that I'm sure that they've kind of overcome that years ago. So I'm really kind of curious what's next. I don't know why they shut down that, that um, project if, if it's fully shut down. Um, next corridor is really two things. And I'll, I'll just, I'll announce it here, why not? I mean, first, Mexico to US. Uh, a strategic partner in that corridor also that will build some new features and functionality that we haven't announced yet. Um, we're also working on some really cool um, possible integrations with Mexico with um, the Zcash team using some features that they haven't released yet. We're excited about that and I think we can do some neat things. Um, after that, it's very likely Barring any sudden regulatory changes, it'd probably to be India for us. And it just that makes a lot of sense for us as a company. It might not fit for other, other companies. Um, Tether, uh, it has a lot of trading volume. Um, that's great if you need market depth. I think that um, Bitfinex has had a lot of trouble getting access to the banking system in the US. And I'm sure that that's a challenge. I think Tether solves a lot of that for Bitfinex. Um, I would like, just with any pegged cryptocurrency like Tether, where for those that don't know what Tether is, it, it was originally called, I think, RealCoin years ago. It was then got some funding, and I remember Brock Pierce was in some round, and I don't remember the details, but they rebranded it Tether, which is just a, a friendlier name that probably um, is a little less irritating to sort of, you know, Bitcoin maxilis or whatever, calling it RealCoin. <clears throat> but it's a pegged cryptocurrency, so a unit of Tether is supposed to be pegged to a dollar, right? What that means is um, you have a, a trust that somebody somewhere has a dollar in a bank account representing that tether. They have been issuing a lot of tether. And if you look at a chart, it's you know, going like that. I would, um, I would love to see um, a, a, an audit by a reputable accounting firm of their current assets um, in US dollar accounts, just to get a reassurance that it matches the number of tether that are issued. I would want to do that before I left any significant amount of money in Tether. That being said, um, I'm also very cautious and conservative. So I, I think that it's serving a real need, especially for Bitfinex. It's had real problems with the banking system. So um, it, it has a use case. And look at the trading volume if you doubt that, right? It uh, trades a lot. So there's a reason for that. I really like the Stellar project. So I was just talking to, um, so, to Lisa from that team, and I met up with Jed at, at Money 2020. Um, I, I think that it's, it's Ripple, Stellar um, have a unique challenge because, and I think Stellar honestly has probably a, a different uh, angle on it and possibly better odds in some ways. And the, the reason I feel that is if you're kind of a for-profit, um, you know, swift replacement cryptocurrency, what's typically gonna happen is you're going to have a strategic alliance with certain large banks, right? But once that happens, you've polarized yourself, right? If, if you have a certain you know, group of banks you're working with, well, there might be others that have different competitive interests because of their other sort of um, existing products in the market that make them money. So it's very hard to sort of bridge that gap and connect competing banks. So um, that's gonna be a challenge for both Stellar and Ripple. I like I like Stellar's approach because it is sort of more of a nonprofit feeling um, project, and um, well, I'm also just a fan of the team. I think they're great people. I don't know Ripple that well. Um, I think Ripple may have a little more traction. They're also earlier, um, but I, I like the idea of Stellar. So I kind of like them both for different reasons. Yeah. With Zcash, how will you do accounting compliance? So um, I think that it's. It's a challenging <laughs> cryptocurrency to talk about, and I, I don't want to speak for them, right? I think that they might have a different way to explain things, but I, I think that um, I don't like shunning things because they're powerful, and I think Zcash is incredibly powerful. Also, Ethereum now that they're rolling in Znarks and things like that could, could be incredibly powerful. There's a huge problem right now. I think that um, 
there are legitimate reasons to want private transactions. You could be a large company. Uh, you might want to keep your vendors private from a competitor. You know, another company gets one employee at your bank and they can see all of your transactions if they work in the right department. So there's, that's a huge, huge issue for a lot of businesses if you want to have competitive privacy in your, in your, your business dealings if you're forced to use a bank. When the, the system is just so flawed and it's so easy to get access to the information, um, never mind intelligence agencies, right? So there's a real problem with privacy. It's not a bad thing. It's not always about buying drugs on the internet. That's not it. And I think that Zcash is addressing those issues and I think it's easy to ignore that. Another great example, um, I could be a woman who lives in a country that doesn't enjoy a whole lot of freedom, and maybe I need to save money to get myself out of an abusive relationship. I can't do that if my bank in that country won't allow me to open a bank account, which is true for a lot of countries, right? It's they sort of, um, whatever the local culture is, you don't have a lot of options. So I think that there's a reason for privacy. Um, with Zcash and accounting, they have both you know, open and shielded transactions. It can work like Bitcoin or it can work like a very private privacy, private uh, cryptocurrency. And they're also releasing new features like, um, that, that I don't know when they're going to come out and I'm not supposed to talk about timing, but the ability for the sender and receiver to see the transaction and an authorized third party. In, in the use case of remittances, that would be law enforcement, right? So if there's a, a, a subpoena or a lawful request for information because one of the parties was doing something criminal, you have a verifiable way to perform the compliance and, and check for money laundering, but in a way that's um, accountable and more transparent than what we have today and safer, frankly. So um, yeah, I, I'm on Telegram. I'm also on Signal. I kind of tend to prefer Signal, but I do both. They're both installed. Yeah. Um, the, the accounting on com and compliance on Zcash, um, we'll have to keep um, a separate record in more of a traditional database and just keep track of kind of the buying and selling prices. Um, it won't be blockchain based probably. Uh, it could be, uh, we're still kind of working on the implementation details, but the way that we're planning on using that technology um, would actually work either way. So, uh, Dash, I, I have, um. I think it's really, un I, have, I have such um, mixed feelings about Dash, you know? Uh, I love the idea and the fact that they actually pay the nodes, that they incent the nodes to, to participate in the network, right? That's something that was missing from Bitcoin. I think there is value to that. Um, I think the core team might be overstating the value a little bit. You know, everybody must run a full node on the Raspberry Pi. It's just, that's, that's crazy talk. However, I think we do have to keep full nodes kind of in the price range that an enthusiast can do it. And I, I think there is a, a centralization risk if we let it get too big too fast. Um, I think Dash is really well designed. And the fact that they pay people to basically run a full node is, is super cool. Um, the privacy isn't as robust as Zcash or Monero, theoretically. I mean, it, barring any flaws we don't know about in any three of them. But it's it's private enough, you know. Unless you're running a super node or, or several of them, it's pretty hard to, to de-anonymize de Dash. Um, I think it does have a little bit of, um, you know, that the ten percent of the you know, outstanding Dash was accidentally mined in the first week or two. I can't remember the details, but you know that 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 whether or not it was completely innocuous, it probably was not intentional. But I think that that's a stigma that people constantly bring up, and I think that that hurts them. So. Um, I don't have a great answer on how to get around that, but um, kind of the people who just say pre-mine, pre-mine, you know, on the, on the forums has been a constant challenge for Dash. I think it has real redeeming qualities and it's done things that are truly innovative. So um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm all for it. Um, how, just wonder how much you rate a fee for remittance to Mexico. Is it based on the amount transferred in US dollars? Yeah. So we, we, um, we go to our site, you type in $3,000. We take 1% of that, so $30 comes out for our fee. Then what we do is if the spot rate that we get from currency markets is below the rate that we can offer by doing a crypto exchange, we take half. So if we're 10% better than mid-market, we keep 5% as our revenue, so we make six. And then we give 5% to the customer, and we split it down the middle. We're very transparent about that, so everybody wins. That makes us potentially, um, even though our fee looks really small, like TransferWise is a loss leader, is just giving away money and spending their VC money to make their stuff happen. We actually are incredibly profitable. And because our rates get so good, 
um, that's when we get our demand. And it's also um, when we're the most profitable. So it's kind of this nice synergy of, of how we price. So we're making most of our money from the FX, not from the 1% fee. It is all in dollars. Um, we don't uh, take it out of Bitcoin or Ethereum or pesos at all. It all comes out right in the beginning in dollars, which makes the accounting a lot simpler. Um, it's going to get messier as we move to more corridors, but you know, not that messy. Oh, the, the amount of USD transferring, we do up to $3,000 a day by USACH. But right now, we're only able to do $25,000 a day by wire. So you can do a domestic wire to do much more. Uh, we're aiming to get that increased substantially, um, hopefully by the end of the year, but definitely in 2018. Yeah. And there's some regulatory complications around that too, but we've, we've got those figured out. So thanks, guys. It's a great question. Um, again, if, if you want to get involved in the project, uh, just have a conversation or whatever. Um, scroll up. It's all there. Um, I love to, you know, just chat on Slack. So please join our community Slack. And um, if you're ever in Denver, hit me up or Boulder. I'm back and forth all the time. Love to meet in person. Thanks, Alex. Uh, bye, guys. Have a great day, okay?